Amen. Again, we are in Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, how poignant it is to hear it read uh, from these men and these ladies. You know, we are talking about the subject of marriage, and you know, I was thinking uh, as they were reading, I got a great deal. I don't know how a great deal Karen got, but uh, I came out good on it. But uh, we're in our second week of our study of the relationship between a husband and wife. And I was thinking this past week, there have been a number of wise individuals who have shared profound and sometimes humorous thoughts about marriage. Socrates, the great philosopher, this made me laugh, once said, by all means marry, if you get a good wife, twice blessed you will be, If you get a bad wife, you'll become a philosopher. (laughs) Don't think things were too swift in Socrates' household there. Chuck Swindoll said this, newlyweds soon discover their marriage license is in reality just a learner's permit. (laughs) Winston Churchill, the great statesman, spoke of the value of his wife to him. He said, my most brilliant achievement was to persuade my wife to marry me. Ogden Nash gave great marital advice when he said this in the marriage setting, when you're wrong, admit it. When you are right, keep quiet. And then there's the profound wisdom of the late Ruth Graham, wife to Billy Graham. She said, a happy marriage is the union of two good forgivers. Isn't that true? You know, the early church, as in the case of the church in every age, is called and was called to be distinct from the world. And the world of the early church had lots of views about men and women. In fact, leading up to the early church time, um, women were not in a very esteemed position in uh, cultures in that part of the world. And at that particular time, often women were considered to be possessions of their husbands. Their husbands ruled over them. However, as we move into the first century of the church, things began to change and the church began to really lead out in that, that women created in the image of God are very special And so as Paul is writing to the early church here at Ephesus, how should the church respond, he would write, in regard to the ever-changing times? Would it embrace tradition and move back to the former norms? Or would it declare there's no distinction at all between the genders? And the answer to that is neither. Neither extreme is right in the Christian life, and in the ministry of the church. In fact, as we look at it, the wife, as we see, is to be submissive to her husband. It doesn't speak to her value at all. It speaks to role. And and there is a distinction between the genders, yet God has a very perfect plan for this institution of marriage. And when we begin to take the whole of Scripture, we begin to grasp it. Last week, we saw that the wife is to submit to her husband willingly. We talked about how that verb was in the middle voice and how it spoke to a voluntary submission. And ladies, today, though, we're going to see the husband's responsibility, and we're going to see that he sets the bar very high. In fact, there are more verses pertaining to the husband in this text than to the women. So I want to look today at God's command to the husband's. And so, husbands, it's time for you to tune in this morning. Ladies, we'll bring you in toward the end as we summarize all this. Uh, and, and as is the case, whenever God's Word is preached, we can all glean something, but primarily the focus today is to husbands. And we see in verse 25, uh, Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives. Now again, as as we look at this, I want to remind you again, husbands, we're going to be looking at a number of verses. Last week we saw the command to the wife or the plea to the wife was submit yourselves to your husbands. And we talked about how that doesn't, especially in our culture today, 
sound very right. In fact, uh, for many people it may sound wrong, but that's not the whole story. We, we read the scripture within the context of what is around it. Last Sunday evening, uh, we had choir practice and we were working on an old familiar hymn. And as we quite often do, we'll, we'll take time and work on various parts. And this particular part was the part that the tenors would sing. And uh, that means I get a break because all I do is sing melody. But as we were listening, David Johnson was standing beside me, and a lot of times we'll, we'll talk back and forth. And after we heard the tenor part, he said, you know, Rick, that doesn't even sound like the song. And I could do nothing but agree. It, it just didn't sound like the song. It, it didn't sound right. In fact, if those notes were played, we probably wouldn't have even recognized it was the song. Yet, you know where I'm going in this. That was just one part, then the bass part was practiced, and then it was all brought together with the melody. And then it all made sense. In fact, with our simple choir, not only did it sound right when it all came together, but it actually was a beautiful thing. And so as we look at the command last week to the wives, submit yourselves, it's not in isolation, but it's brought together the beautiful composer God who so composed marriage that the wives would submit to their husbands, but we'll see added to that the part of the husbands that we husbands are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And so I want to look at that today. As we look at it, we're to love our wives, first we see, as Christ loved the church. This is the first of three ways that Paul describes our love as husbands is to be for our wives. And so he says, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Now the verb that Paul uses for love is a very distinct word. You know where we're going with this. It's the word agape, which is a self-sacrificial love. It is a love that is totally concerned with the well-being of the other. In fact, eros love, which is not agape love, eros love takes. Philia love exchanges, but agape love gives. It gives unconditionally. Unless the husband think that he has it easy, Paul focuses on three aspects of Christ's love for the church. And this love that Christ has for the church husbands is our model. First, we see it is a sacrificial love. Christ loved us, it says, and gave himself for her. He gave himself for the church in the same way we husbands are to give ourselves for uh, our wives. Jesus gave his life, he gave his will, he gave his desires for the church, even to the point of dying for the church. And we might add that this sacrifice that he made was unconditional. In other words, the object uh, did not have to respond in a particular way for Jesus to give that love. In fact, think about the disciples that he loved so much. When he went, um, to Gethsemane, uh, they couldn't even stay awake. Uh, when, when, he, when he arrived at the cross, uh, they weren't around him. Uh, and, and think about us. He died for us, it tells us in Romans, while we were still his enemies, while we didn't even know who he was. Christ's love is unconditional. Husbands, do you want to have a great home? Do you want to have a great marriage? It begins by loving your wife as Christ loved the church, sacrificially, unconditionally. But not only did he love the church sacrificially, but he loved it purposefully. You see, it's one thing to just sacrifice but have no goal in sight, but Jesus had a distinct goal in sight for his bride the church. And we see two purpose clauses in our text. We see in verse 25 that, he, that, that, that the husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And then in verse 26, we see the first purpose mentioned, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. 
Jesus' sacrificial love for the church had the goal being to make the church better, more righteous, more holy, more pure. That's why Jesus died. But not only that, we see in verse 27, he also did this and we see the purpose to present the church to him in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. The words without spot speak to any external blemish. The word without wrinkle speaks of no intrinsic flaw. And so the point is this, Jesus loved the church with the purpose of seeing the church grow in holiness. Husbands, is that the desire for your wife? It, it, is your prayer for her that she would grow in holiness? It, are you the answer to that prayer? Are you leading her to become more like Christ? And so we see a third aspect of that love. Not only is the love of Christ sacrificial and purposeful, but it is love without limit. Jesus loves the church beginning to end. Verse 26 speaks of the beginning. And it says, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water uh, by the word. And the idea is not that the act of baptism literally cleanses someone, but baptism is, is an initiation. It speaks of a beginning. And so the washing is what? Not by the water, but by the word. In other words, Jesus Christ worked and, and sacrificed himself at the beginning uh, that the church might be justified. But then it moves to verse 27. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. You know, as I was thinking of Christ's love for the church, I thought about probably the most vivid visual depiction of his love. And again, as, as we read in verse 21, submit to one another, we see the direct command for the wives to submit to the husbands, but the husband's will is to be that of a servant, to submit to the wife. And so Jesus, uh, in his last hours before he died, when he was with his disciples, he knelt down and he washed the disciples' feet. And that was a depiction how they their Lord, he himself, would die for them. But it said right before that in verse 1, he said, knowing uh, that his own, they were his own and he loved them. It said this, he loved them to the end. That's uh, John 13 and verse 1. He loved them to the end. Husbands, you're to love your wife to the end. To the end. Look at verse 27. We mentioned how verse 26 speaks of justification, but verse 27 speaks of glorification. Now between that is that process of salvation, sanctification that Christ is working, but he's speaking really of A to Z. Verse 26 is A at the beginning when that individual trusts Christ, but notice verse 27. What is he doing? Presenting the church to himself in what? In splendor without spot or wrinkle, nothing external of a blemish, nothing internal that is, that is corrupt or, or unacceptable. When is Christ going to present the church to himself? When he comes again, when he comes again. So husbands, I ask you today, are you loving your wives sacrificially? Are you loving your wives purposefully? Are you, uh, are you looking for ways? Are you studying your wife? Are you thinking of ways that you can make her more holy and more like Christ? And then are you committed like Christ to the end to love your wives? And so Paul says not only first that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church, but then he says, husband, love your wives as your own bodies. And he follows that, and there are primarily two ways that we love our own bodies. And the first is this, we provide for our bodies. We provide for our bodies. Notice what it says, verse 29, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides for it. We provide for our bodies. When I am hungry, I eat. When I'm tired, 
I lie down. We meet by nature our own needs. We do it instinctively. And, and Paul says this, husbands, that we are to so love our wives that we love them, that we provide for them even as we would provide for ourselves. That, that we move outside of our egocentricity and we begin to think, what is best for my wife? What does she need here? How can I provide that? As a husband, we're to be a, a provider. We're to provide for our wives. But not only that, we protect them. Notice what it says, for no one, verse 29, ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for that, for them. We have a built-in protection mode. If I see a hot stove and I'm in my right mind, I will not stick my hand on the eye of that stove. Why is it? Because I don't want to feel pain. We don't want to be embarrassed, do we? And we'll do anything to protect ourselves from it. I was laughing uh, this past week. I was helping a group of, uh, of middle schoolers and helping a friend of mine and they had sort of a, a get together, a gathering in Farmville. It was on Monday. And um, so I w went late afternoon and we had pizza and I ate pizza and then we had s'mores and I had one of the kids make a s'mores for me. And I ate that thing and marshmallow got all on me. Now I'm famous or rather infamous for being the messiest eater wherever I am. And so here I am, I've got marshmallow on my cheek, I've got it on, and here are sixth and seventh grade boys that face are as clean as I don't know what. One of my friends said, you've got some stuff here, and immediately you know what I did. I wanted to get it off for two reasons. One, I didn't want Karen to know I fudged on my diet and I ate. <laughs> but secondly, who wants to walk around with stuff on your face, especially when kids could eat more neatly? So what did I do? I cleaned it off. Why? Because I care for myself, for my own body. I, I, I care about myself. I don't want to be embarrassed. I protected myself. You know, there are lots of things that I hate. I've shared before. I hate fast food workers that work slow. I want to jump over the counter and start going at it. All right? There are a lot of things that get on my nerves. But one thing I hate is when a husband embarrasses his wife in public. Not cool. Not cool at all. You're to be a protector. It angers me when I see it. If someone makes fun of your wife, you defend your wife. Don't ever joke about her cooking, joke about things. You know what I'm saying. Protect her as if she were a queen. Protect her like your own body. Defend her. Christ loved his body. Look at what it says in verse 30. Since we are members of his body, we're members of his body. And likewise, even as Christ loved his body, we're to love our wives, our own flesh, as we would our own bodies. But then finally, we see a third thing. Husbands, we're to love our wives more than anyone except God himself. God first, husband, and then your wife. Sometimes we get that out of whack when we have children, wives toward husbands or husbands toward wives. You begin to see everything invested in the kids and not in the marriage. And then when the kids are gone, then you're there. The beautiful thing of the Word of God is we can always readjust. We can always say, God, I want to reacclimate because no institution is more precious to God than the institution of marriage. I would argue that the church itself is equally valued of God. In fact, even in describing his church and his marriage, we see both mentioned here. God said it was not good for the man to be alone, and so he created woman. God determined that the home would be the primary context through which education would be attained for the child. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Husbands, not only are you to love your wife as Jesus loves the church sacrificially, purposely, and without limit, 
Not only are you to love your wives as your own body, providing and protecting her, but your love for her is to exceed anything and anyone except for your love for God himself. Over the past couple of days, uh, Karen and I got away and visited our oldest son and our two granddaughters, and it was a lot of fun. We enjoyed it. Uh, we went to Suffolk, and Friday was a pretty day, and Wilson and Brittany uh, said to Karen and me, she's Gigi, I'm Papa, said, uh, let's go to the park. There's a park about two blocks down. We walked down to it, and there were a bunch of girls when we arrived playing, and everything was just so smooth. And then came the van. Two boys jumped out, and they changed everything. It was wide open. They were bouncing off stuff. I, I had a little mushroom. It was a thing that spun like a merry-go-round. I was spinning it, and our granddaughter was having fun. And then I'm spinning it. This boy had gotten on the back end of it. And all of a sudden, I heard a thud. The boy had hit the ground. He wasn't sitting in the seat. He was sitting cockeyed like some type of renegade. And before, <laughs> and the first thing I thought is he's going to let out a scream and run to his mom, and I'm in trouble. No, that boy got up and went the other direction and kept going. <laughs> and that was the big brother. The little brother came a little later, and Wilson said, watch this. I've seen this boy. He said, he's going to blow up in a minute. And so he's running, he's running and running, and I mean, it went like that. He smacked down like that, and about time I thought, is he going to cry? Will said, that boy isn't going to cry. He bounced right back up and kept going, ran into something. He was running into everything. <laughs> Guys, we can be like those boys sometimes. We can mess up. But I like the perseverance of those little boys. They got back up, and they kept going. Hey, what do we do, husbands, when we fall short? What do we do when we're dropping the ball with our wives? We're not loving them as we ought. We get back up. We repent. God, God, I'm sorry. God, give me the strength to be able to be the husband that you would have me to be. You know the beautiful thing about God is he's a God of second chances no matter how long it's been. I look at my wife. She's more virtuous than I, and I don't just say that as a false humility. She's a motivation to me. Some of you husbands, maybe your wives are like that. You look and say, man, she's been with me thick and thin. Hey, that deserves our honor. That deserves the love of Christ. So I close with this. What if wives, and here's where you come in, what if you say, hey, I've been... I've been trying to submit. I, I, I've bit my lips sometimes rather than spoke, speaking. I, I've, I've tried to honor my husband and not, not nag him, but it doesn't seem to be working. What do I do, Pastor? Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Believe God. God will honor it. Remember last week, wives, I shared the story of that wife who quietly served the Lord and then her husband, before he passed, believed in the Lord, sat right up in the church, and she had a smile on her face as she sat beside him. She had a smile. Keep with it. Husbands, what if you say, I'm trying to love my wife and I don't seem to be getting anywhere? Keep doing it. Keep serving. Keep sacrificing. Keep loving. Because God promises that if you do your part, he'll take care of it. Believe him for it. So it says in verse 33, to sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Let's pray. Fathers, we've looked at this subject of marriage. Um, Lord, we've chuckled some at sayings of wise people in the past as we've looked at personal experiences, as we've looked at your word. Father, we acknowledge today that you are the composer of marriage. This beautiful institution for the benefit of society, the strengthening of children, 
the needs of husbands and wives to be met. Lord, you created it as a gift. And Father, as we look at the various parts that come together, the husband and the wife, and next week as we look at the children, uh, Lord, we know that it works best when we do what you've called us to do. Lord, there's some wives out here, they're, they're doing exactly what your word says, and they're waiting patiently, loving their husbands through that gentle spirit. And I pray, God, you would honor it. I pray that you would honor it in a way that they would celebrate, Lord, what you're doing in their husbands' lives. Lord, there's some husbands that may be struggling today. They're, maybe they're struggling because they haven't been everything they should be. But God, you let us get back up and go again when we repent. But Father, there may be some fathers today that are loving their wives sacrificially but not getting the return that they expect. But Lord, keep them mindful of the fact that you love the disciples even when they slept, even when they didn't follow you to the end. That Lord, you loved us even while we were your enemies. And Father, in marriage, unconditional love, forgiveness, forbearance is so precious. And so I pray for the marriages in our church. I pray that there would be an awakening of, of love between husband and wife and that the fruit would be many-fold and long-lasting. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn.